Welcome to Startup Health Now, the weekly webcast that celebrates the healthcare transformers and change makers reimagining healthcare. My name is Unity Stokes, and today we've got a special guest, healthcare transformer Andre Zemeles, who's the co founder and president of Doctor.com, one of the greatest domain names in healthcare today. We've got a diverse conversation. Today we're going to dig into all things SaaS, the power of a great name, and open versed closed platforms in healthcare. Stick around, it's going to be a great show. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious. With the fires that burn within us. But I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take those who take it. So welcome, Andre. It's great to have you here at uh, Startup Health Now. Uh, super excited about the conversation today. I thought we'd kick the discussion off. Uh, love to hear about the mission of Doctor.com. What is it? What is, What are you guys trying to do with Doctor.com? Sure. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Um, when we think about our mission, we really think about the fact that today doctors, especially those in sort of small to medium-sized practices, are really at a disadvantage. Right. The sort of world has changed around them. And you know, they went to medical school, they're great clinicians, they worry about their patients, they worry about clinical care, but they didn't necessarily spend a lot of time studying technology, even studying business. And what's happened is... They studied medicine. They studied medicine, exactly. And what's happened is everything that was the status quo, how people found them, how patients sort of uh, researched who to go see when they came in the door, what their expectations were. That's all kind of been flipped on its head in the past few years. A couple of factors sort of contributing to that. What are some one, of those factors? Yeah. Sure. So one is just a proliferation of high deductible health plans with you know, the uh, Health Care Changes, Affordable Care Act, et cetera. People are now paying a lot more out of pocket, or at least the first portion of their health care spending is hitting them in the wallet, whereas before it was just covered magically by some payer entity. Two, so they're shopping around and having to find their own providers and paying attention to cost and those types of things? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if you think about it, when it's your money, not some insurance company's money, you're going to do a lot of research. And it's always been the case with sort of the cosmetic procedures, elective procedures, where people would really comparison shop. But now even more general procedures, you know, if the first $1,000 of your health care spending is coming out of your pocket, or in some cases the first $10,000 you're going to want to make sure that you're really going to the right person for you who has expertise in your specific area of concern, et cetera. So that's one factor. Another factor is just a, also the proliferation of peer-to-peer -peer feedback, right? The same way that people, you know, if you're going to go to a restaurant, you probably go on Yelp or OpenTable. You, know, you don't just need to ask your friend because you have 500 friends you've left reviews or even if they're not your friends. You want the social proof of what's good and what's not. Exactly. So those two factors alone, and there's many others, have created a climate where people now, when they go to find a doctor, even if they have a referral, and there have been studies about this, the, the uh, American Medical Association, I think, sponsored a study, a bunch of other entities have done studies, Pew Research, et cetera, that even when people are getting referred to a doctor, very often their first stop is Google. And so in, to tie it back to our mission, recognizing that paradigm and recognizing that a lot of the innovation, a lot of the technology companies sort of entering this, this marketplace are really looking at the patient side of that, saying, well, great, let's, let's give patients more information, let's help patients be better informed, let's help them make those comparisons, which is all great, and we're very supportive of that. We sort of looked at it from the other angle. We said, well, who, who's looking out for the doctors, right? Who's kind of looking at this through the lens of someone who's, you know, maybe been in practice 10, 15 years, or maybe they're starting their practice, entering this, and they need to maintain a patient base, grow a patient base, maintain their online presence, their reputation, et cetera. All so you've really created um, an online platform to, to make it easy for every doctor to do that? Exactly. Exactly. So with doctor.com, effectively, we take all of the fear and all of the expertise that they may not have time or the ability to acquire on their own and sort of 
move that off in the equation and say, look, we're one trusted partner. It's pretty much a do it for you service, meaning they hire us, they get on our platform, and we take care of things like making sure that the 50, 100 websites they're listed on all have their right, correct address information, their correct insurance affiliations, a beautiful photo of their practice, et cetera. Making sure they have a strategy to be proactive about patient reviews. So instead of you know, a negative review coming out of the blue because somebody had a billing issue with their insurance and that being like this really scary event and they don't know what to do and it's hurting their reputation, we now kind of put the power back in their hands to be very proactive about getting positive feedback from the happy patients, which is usually the overwhelming majority. I mean, we don't have a single client who has more unhappy patients than happy patients. Wow. It's just usually the deck is kind of stacked against them in that respect. So a, a couple of interesting things to unpack here. So from what I understand your, or what I know, your platform is open. Um, so what, what are the difference be, differences between an open versus a, a, a closed platform in terms of being able to, to really help these doctors manage their, their reputation online or, or do what you're talking about online? Sure, it's a, great, it's a great question. I appreciate you asking it because it's something that actually comes up when we're speaking to doctors. You know, they'll, for example, say, well, how are you guys different than someone like ZocDoc? Which is a great question. By the way, ZocDoc's a great company. I have a lot of respect for them. But ZocDoc is a great example of sort of a closed platform, a walled garden, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's its own ecosystem. The patients on ZocDoc are people who are going to ZocDoc to find a doctor. Doctors who are listed there are listed only on ZocDoc. And where we say we're an open platform, is doctor.com exists sort of outside of any one website or any one app or any one ecosystem. You know, what we've sort of done is connected our solution, which sort of is the layer that the doctors interact with, to an entire network of health and local business sites. So to, to illustrate this very specifically, if a doctor updates his or her information one time in our system, and again, that could then be just calling their account manager with us, their practice consultant, and that person would, would actually do the updating. Uh, that update then is multiplied out across you know, 20, 30, 50 sites where they may be listed because we have built connections. So all those, to different, all those different sites. channels that people find when they go to Google, there can be dozens of different review sites, dozens of different listing sites. You guys work to sort of update many of those. Exactly. And the simplest way to think about it from a sort of a visual example, if you Google a doctor or a dentist or, or any, any medical practitioner, uh, you will typically see of those 10 results that show up, usually between seven to nine of them are partners that we work with. Not always, but most of the time. So we've sort of gone out and said, well, well who's out there that is a real player that has a, a scale audience of patients that are going there to get information about who they should go see for care. And we, we sort of worked down that list starting at the top with you know, very large partners like Vitals, for example, is one of our big partners. Gets, I think, more reviews and, and one of the highest uh, amounts of patient traffic versus anyone else. We started with the largest sites and have worked our way down. And each one of those relationships is very unique. It's both a technology connection, which really sets us apart because we're not just sort of doing this stuff by hand. We actually have proprietary technology that connects into all these sites. So you're very much a technology company. We are. We are a technology company. Um, although to get these relationships in place is also a lot of a lot of sort of happens on the business side. There really are relationships with our partners mm. because it's one thing to just have the technology connection, but beyond that, you know, we have to facilitate partnership where they feel like they're getting great, trustworthy, authentic content from us about our clients and doctors. So, so you have an interesting model. It's a SaaS model. Um, what does that mean to, uh, to a provider, to a doctor um, who may not even understand what a, a SaaS model is? I, I think it's a very important business model that's, that a lot of great companies are uh, employing today. Um, what are the advantages of a SaaS model? What does that mean to, to your customers out there? Sure, again, it's, it's a great question. And just in case anyone watches, you know, SaaS is software as a service. And what that essentially means is that rather than paying one large lump sum up front and getting a you know, box of software or, or a solution in a box that you then you know, use and eventually use up and, and rebuy years later, SaaS sort of implies software as a service. So it's everything is in the cloud, remotely managed, it takes IT out of the equation, 
and it's deliver it's evergreen it's always delivered it's always update it's always uh, up to date it's always current and someone essentially buys it like a subscription like a magazine subscription except it's a service so for like, us, do you pay every year, every month? How does that work? Sure. So we, we actually are pretty flex, far more flexible than most who sell in the medical industry, where typically it's a, it's prepaid for the year, and we, and we have year you know one to three year contracts with clients. But depending on the circumstances, the size of the practice, etc., we will have quarterly uh, billing cycles as well, and sometimes even month to month billing cycles. And what we found that really is is a value with this model is unlike traditional software where again there's you know if you if you buy a boxed EMR software for example to manage a practice you know the difference would be you know you're maybe paying twenty thousand dollars up front for some boxed software and then that might even change later, in a in a year and all of a sudden you're stuck with this legacy package. Exactly. And if your office burns down and your computer gets melted, it's all it's all gone, right? But now that, that industry has also mostly gone to a SaaS or a software as a service based model where it all lives in the cloud and your desk computer at the doctor's office is basically just a terminal that accesses that data remotely. So for us to deliver our service that way, it means a couple things. One, it means you don't need a tech guy or a web guy, an IT person to deal with it. And even when we, when we actually have a physical device in the doctor's office, which is part of our service, even that, it just pulls everything from the cloud. They literally plug it in and put it on their Wi-Fi network. So does this mean that a doctor can now focus on medicine and helping <laughs> their patients instead of search engine optimization and fixing reviews and inaccuracies online? Is that basically what you're saying? No, absolutely. Not not just a doctor, but but often it's their staff their as staff, well. Who yeah. are really, you know, usually what happens is is the doctor spends just enough time to be very concerned about this, and they recognize it's impacting their practice, and then they often lean heavily on their staff to help sort of sort through it and, and figure out what to do. But again, the, these people are, who are working in doctor's office are usually very busy. They, you know, they're they're hardworking people. They're overburdened. They're dealing with patient incoming phone calls, with billing, with insurance. So it's not ideal for it to be on their shoulders either. So what this means is instead of them having to figure out how to you know, get a piece of software set up and maintained and deal with IT and all of that and have to sort of puzzle through it, they just simply sign on with us and it all just sort of magically happens in the background. And what we also found is because folks are so busy in doctor's offices, they don't like to have to go hunting for information about, say, how well the service is performing for them. So we learned early on, we actually built this beautiful dashboard where clients could come and log in and get all this information, run all these reports. It's actually very underutilized. It, it wasn't nearly as popular as we thought. We realized it's just because people were so busy. Hmm. They're just so busy. So what we have now done has become increasingly better at pushing information to our clients when they need to know it. So, you know, if they get a, a great review, we let them know. If they got a you know a negative review popped up somewhere on the web that you know we, we may not be in direct control of, but we've detected it, we'll let them know, hey, watch out, you know, somebody just wrote a bad review on Yelp. Here's what you may want to do to respond to that. Uh, and, and, and similar types of notifications, if you get a call, an appointment request, et cetera. So sort of building that platform to, to push the right information at the right time to the right person in the office has been very helpful in our clients being able to get the most out of our service. So, so push versus pull being one, one lesson learned, is there anything else that might be helpful to other entrepreneurs out there that might be thinking about their business model, considering SaaS or software as a service model? What what have you learned? What what nuggets could you share maybe with other entrepreneurs about what works or, or maybe what doesn't work in terms of the SaaS model? Sure, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think with SaaS in particular, it, it moves very fast and more important, I mean, it, this is always important, but I find that particularly in, in the sort of the industry that we're in with the clients that we have and the speed at which everything is moving, having incredible people on your team is really, really important. So what I would say, sort of one philosophy we've always had at doctor.com, which has served us really, really well, is in any given position, we try to find someone who is really hungry for that role, hmm. who's been ready for it for a long time. And this is particularly true in management roles, but who has probably been bumping up against the ceiling 
in their current role. Meaning, you know, we, we see it, for example, in our in our customer service. It's someone who's been a, a rock star account manager or, or a client service specialist somewhere else. And they've been ready to to build out a team onto them for two years. But you have They're ready for varsity, they've been on the bench or J V for a while and, and ready to sort of break out. Exactly. And so we we would rather hire those people than necessarily someone who's done it for years somewhere else. And what we've found is they bring a level of passion that far outweighs any, any ramp up sort of in terms of domain expertise someone may need to have entering the role, sort of moving up, moving up the ladder rung. Whatever we may lose in, in prior experience, we gain tenfold in passion and enthusiasm and dedication. And so that, just as a philosophy... Is that so they have the agility to keep up with the pace of, of what a SaaS model requires? Because yeah. it's constantly evolving and... Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing about SaaS is every, every time a billing cycle renews, it's essentially you need to rewin the trust of your customer. Unlike you sell a box of software, the day you've sold it, Really, you have no further obligation other than whatever is in this, the fine print that that person's committed to and you've committed to when they purchase the software. But for us, if someone's paying us quarterly or, or yearly or even in rare cases monthly, every billing cycle, and let, you know, once they're, uh, you know, depending on their contract terms, you know, every, every several billing cycles, you know, we have to secure renewal. We have to get another vote of confidence for them. And so that means that the work of service never ends, right? And, and when you get to a, a large number of clients as we have, it is ever more important that the people who are responsible for taking care of those customers are, are the best in the world. And I really feel one thing we've done, you know, we've, we've, we've paid up for the best talent and we've sought out those people who don't bring a lot of preconceived notions to the table, who may not have the, the mile long resume of prior experience but who are incredibly passionate and incredibly talented. And I would encourage any other entrepreneur when they think about hiring, don't necessarily, don't necessarily go for that person with the shiny, burnished resume who's done it before for years. Go very for passion. Often, very often, yeah, passion and someone who's, whose aspiration has been, has been to do that job yeah. for a while. Yeah. So w one thing I wanted to ask you about, doctor.com. Um, you've sure. got a great, great name. Um, what is the what is the power of a brand like that? What what how do you shepherd that? What does it do for your business? What are some of the maybe lessons learned in terms of how a name can be leveraged as you're building your your company? Sure. Well, something interesting that we've found is the so sort of the power. It's a natural brand, right? And the power of that brand is such that we always have to live up to it. So what I mean by that when when we call and we talked to an office and we're calling from doctor.com, there's an immediate assumption that if we have a domain name of that caliber, we're a company of a certain level, it's achieved a certain amount of success that's gotten to a certain point. And you know, it's funny, people often think we're a much larger organization than we are. Um, they, they, they often think, you know, it's really funny, we'll talk to a client, they'll, they'll lump us in with companies that have a thousand employees. You know, we, we don't even have a hundred yet. Um, and so knowing that, it, it's, it's a positive pressure on us and on the entire team to really live up to that and to, when it's a good thing, deliver this sort of big company service to, to the level of polish and the level of, of rigor in, in process and in sort of being on top of, of everything that you'd find with a larger company. But for us, the internal challenge is always to maintain our agility. So it's a bit of a balance. And the brand really is a force of Again, it's creating an expectation in, in every conversation that we were providing a certain level of service. And so, so it's, it's a positive What about um, any tips you recommend to on other entrepreneurs that may be trying to get a good name, think of a good name, create a good name? Um, there, there's a lot of different philosophies on, on this. Uh, how, is, should, is it one of the most important things you guys decided from the beginning we want a great name? I mean, what's, I think in our what case, should entrepreneurs sure, be thinking about? Sure. Um, I think in our case, it was somewhat opportunistic that we had the ability to acquire the domain name. Uh, but that said, it was something that we knew would serve us very well, given how we plan to grow the business. And you know, as it pertains to other entrepreneurs, I really think 
you don't necessarily have to have a premium domain name, right? I would, I would not recommend that someone getting started spends their first million dollars buying a world-class domain name. That's probably a better use of that capital. Uh, with that said, I think the name that one chooses must be chosen very carefully because you don't have any chances to change it. It's almost always a bad idea to change your branding, to change your name. You're sort of pressing the reset button on, on whatever you built up over time. So, you know, I personally have a pet peeve against all these cutesy names. Anything that ends in a dot L Y right. or a, you know, it's, it's sort of to me, why why lump yourself in with sort of a convention like that when you can be more creative and be different? So I would encourage people, don't be scared to be different, be creative, but it just it has to be memorable, and it should really it should either speak to what you're doing, and you have to know. If you're going to be as specific as a as a doctor.com or or a, you know find a doctor.com or something that that is descriptive of the business in the name, you are locking yourself in. You know, there's only so much you can pivot within that. So I would say if you haven't yet figured out what your final business model is going to be, if you're going to sell to insurance or to hospitals or whatever, maybe maybe go with something more like a Google or a Yahoo or that's not necessarily hyper specific because you have a lot more ability to, to change the business model and not have to change the name. You don't want, you don't want to be dentist.com and decide you're better off selling to plastic surgeons and dentists in six months. Right, right. So just as a, a note on the main name specificity. Yeah, got it. Uh, so you're, um, you're a serial entrepreneur. You've been an entrepreneur for a long time. Why did you become an entrepreneur? Was there a moment, was there an aha moment where you you knew this is how you were going to spend your your time and energy? It's, it's a question I appreciate. Um, for me, I think I knew when I figured out how much I hated school that I would probably not be a very good employee anywhere. I, I bounced through seven schools and dropped out of high school. so. Along that journey, it became pretty apparent that I was going to have to kind of blaze my own trail uh, to to be happy and to make the most of my abilities. I'm just not someone who typically does well being a cog in a very big wheel, and I think there's many people for whom that works, and more power to them. I actually sometimes, there have been times in my life I've been envious of the ability to fit into that and excel within that. For me, I've always been someone who I kind of have to learn it the hard way, and it usually means just diving into it and figuring out how to either sink or swim. Right. Uh, so I knew very early on that I would need to go on, on my own path, so to speak. So how did that lead to, did, was there a mentor or something that happened in your life where you understood even what the entrepreneurial opportunity was? What so, guided you there? It actually didn't, didn't happen by choice. I got laid off from my first job ever and I had three months of severance pay. And I, I, had, I had dabbled before that. I had started some small sort of lifestyle businesses on the side, and, and you know, I had built some income streams separate from the day job, which was very helpful during that time. But really, that moment, I sort of told myself, I, I, I'm not going to put blood, sweat, and tears into something else that is ultimately out of my control and, and end up here again. Uh, you know, so I'm going to take this little bit of severance pay, and I'm going to take the position that I'm in now and, and I'm going to go and build something on my own and you know that's probably going to hopefully lead to multiple things of my own after that and, and get started down that path and so were you, was, were you, how did you feel were you scared were you exhilarated were you happy to be free what, what was the feeling going through your 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 mind at, at that point it's, it's a good question I mean, just being laid All off of the above maybe yeah. um no, seriously, so there's obviously the fear, because living in Manhattan is not inexpensive, and you know, I was, I think I was, uh, you know, I was 21, 22 at the time, so I was young, and it wasn't like I you know, had a, a bunch of immediately available opportunities. So there was, that, there was that natural fear, but there was an incredible sense of liberation. I, it was almost like that was an inevitable moment. I knew it was gonna happen. It just was sort of the, the kick in the butt I needed to, to jump into doing my own thing sooner. Because honestly, it's very easy to get comfortable, especially when you live somewhere with a high cost of living, whether it's a Bay Area, New York, wherever. It's very easy when you have something that pays the bills that you don't hate, that you feel like you're getting value from, that even if you have that sort of entrepreneurial drive welling up to say, 
I'll put it off a year, I'll put it off two years. You know, I'll wait for this to happen, I'll wait for that to happen. Sometimes, and I'm not the only one who has a story like this, sometimes you need that kick that you didn't see coming to sort of push you to say, all right, you know, I'm just gonna take the plunge. Because it's never really gonna be the right time necessarily. So do you do. think more people should take that plunge? I mean, what, there's a, we're living in this golden age of, of entrepreneurship where it's really easier are. to be, Come an entrepreneur to take those kinds of risks. You don't have to go to college the way people thought yeah. you used to. There's things like, you know, the Theo Fellowship, where the whole point is to support that way of thinking. Which is um, awesome. Huge fan of that, by the way. So should should more people become entrepreneurs, or who, you know, do who do you recommend take this plunge, take this journey? I do think I think I do think that it's generally something that if someone feels it in their heart that it's it's a way of life and it's an aspiration they want to try that everybody should try it who has that feeling. What I think is very important is people are honest with themselves if they're ultimately cut out for it or not. And and what I say is not everyone is built to handle the level of stress that comes with it all being on you at the end of the day. Some people are are made for it. Some people they, they just aren't. They actually find that it's, it's a very uncomfortable way to live versus, you know, the clock strikes five, you're done, you don't have to think about work till nine the next day. And so I think people have to be honest with themselves, but everybody should give it a shot because it is one of those things. There's no, no amount of books you can read or blogs you can follow or whatever that are going to prepare you for actually just doing it. Uh, and, I, and I also think that it's very important. This is, uh, you know, sort of cliche at this point because many people say it, but I think it's very important to have an outlook that you don't beat yourself up when things don't work. I mean, all the successful entrepreneurs I know have had stumbles on the way, myself included. Some, some have had epically terrible stumbles and then have gone on to do great things. And I think one of the qualities that is almost ubiquitous amongst entrepreneurs that I know and respect is that they embrace they, failure, accept that as not the end of the world. Yeah, you, you have to bounce. I think resilience would be like the number one. If someone said, what's the one word you'd say that you know, an entrepreneur needs to have as a quality, let's say it's resilience. Because things will not always go your way, no matter how brilliant or creative or whatever you they are. They almost never go your they way. They almost never do. Yeah. And, and you get to a point where you actually, you almost, you're so expecting that eventually something bad is going to happen. And when it actually happens, it's almost part of the challenge. It becomes almost part of the game and you actually, you actually feel yourself challenging yourself and how you respond to that and how adaptable you are and how well you saw it. Like, the problems no longer are scary because you know they're gonna be there. It's, the thrill is in, all right, here, here's another one. Like, how do we get over this mountain? How do we get around it? How do we blast through it if we have to, whatever it is. And so that's, you learn to love it. But that's, again, n not everybody wants to do that and that's totally fine. The world wouldn't work if everybody was doing that. Right? Yeah. You, you need some people who who love the stability and consistency of a, of a really nice job. Yeah. So I wanted to wrap up with um, some, a, a speed round, some fun questions. You, you mentioned there's no book uh, you can sort of read to learn what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Do you have a favorite book? Do you have a book that you uh, recommend to other entrepreneurs or that's really helped you along the way? So it's interesting. I don't know if, if I have a... An, a book necessarily that I would recommend to other entrepreneurs. I think there's a few things I recommend. So a book that I read way before it was as well known as it is now is a four hour work week by Tim Ferriss, which at the time at the time that I read it was more than anything very validating because I was I was going down that path and this was before there was nearly as much sort of chatter around, you know, sort of the building lifestyle businesses and going out on your own and breaking out of the corporate mold. And it's now like a big buzzy thing, but you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't. And so, or maybe it was a little less than 10 years ago. So having seen that book and seeing someone articulate as well as Tim did, the framework for that, that actually matched up very closely to what I was doing was just like an awesome moment. I'm like, all right, I'm not alone. And someone who's very smart has given a lot of thought to this. And then another book, totally unrelated, that I've just been recommending broadly is a book called Shantaram. Shantaram, okay. Yeah, and it's, I. I can't possibly begin to describe it. It's, it's a book about travel, adventure. It's, it's based pretty closely, apparently, on a true story. It's one of the most remarkable true life stories I've, I've ever seen. But it's, I think anybody who is entrepreneurial in nature, who appreciates 
the adventure and the peril and the risk and the, the highs, highs and the low lows of entrepreneurship will appreciate the wild ride that is this book. Awesome. So we'll, we'll put links to both of those in, in the show notes. Cool. Um, and what, what do you do? You know, it's, it can be stressful tolling on your body being an entrepreneur. What do you do to stay healthy? Very important. I make people crazy at the office because I'm a bit of a, I, I will tend to preach about these things, but I mean, it's, it's, it's the old, like the classic diet and exercise more than anything. Um, I think it's very important to be physically active. I mean, countless studies have shown that like exercise, not just for your body, it's for your mind. And I would somewhat argue also for your spirit, for your confidence. And I've always felt that if you're not sound of body and if you're not physically confident in your, in your physicality and your, you know, your tangible being, that it's very hard to, to mentally bring all that you have to bear. And that you, know, you, you, you never want to have a, a weak link anywhere. So for me, it's, you know, the, the one thing I'm terrible with is the sleeping. You should get sleep. I'm not very good at that, but it's recommended. Is that because you're working? late or I think it's it's a it's the entrepreneurial disease that many have I think it's you know the work they never again it's why not everyone's cut out for if you need your nine hours of beauty rest don't become an entrepreneur right but um but but exercise you know I think really intense I think also do you have a daily routine or weekly routine well this this may be a strange intro I I love violent sports I love combat sports I do Muay Thai Jiu Jitsu boxing MMA stuff and the reason that I really love these sports is because I think there's, when you're in a ring with an opponent, even if it's a very friendly opponent, which is most of the time, it's not like I'm a professional fighter or anything like that, there's a level of truth that you have. It strips away everything. So there's two things that happen in, in, in those sorts of environments, there, you know, the, the combat gym, so to speak, whatever the martial art is. One, it attracts all walks of life and all normal social barriers are gone because it's very pure. You're, you're with somebody else across from you. So you and your opponent shorts. in the ring. Yeah, and, and you know you have people from Wall Street, you have people from you know the corner block in the Bronx, and you have everything in between, and it's awesome because you get groups of people who would never cross-pollinate. And all pretense and all sort of social hierarchies and status is stripped away. It's very pure. So that part of it, I think, is beautiful. And two, I think it's an incredible test. Like, it forces you to be very, very honest with yourself about your limitations, your abilities, your thresholds in a way that very few other things do. I feel like those experiences, it goes beyond the exercise piece of it and you actually learn a lot. And I'm not saying it's the only way to get it. Some people find that through meditation, yoga, whatever. That happens to be my chosen vehicle for getting that. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for all you're doing. Where can people find out uh, more about doctor.com? And, and you, I guess it's pretty easy to figure I, that out, right? I think, I think they can go to doctor.com. <laughs> it's in the name. I pre- appreciate uh, the question. And, you know, we, we, we have not had a very strong social media presence to date. I think some of that's going to change over time. We're on, we're on uh, you know, we're on Twitter. I think we, we're actually at doctor on Twitter. So we, we didn't stop the domain name. We went for the primo Twitter I, handle I like it. As well. I like it. Uh, so you can you can follow us there, and eventually we'll actually be doing more. There. Well, con- congrats on all your success, and, and congrats for um, the being a, you know going on that journey of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, it, it's a wonderful journey for those who uh, who've been on it and, and understand the the joys of of it, and also how to manage the the challenges of it. So thank Thanks you so much, Unity. It's been a great pleasure. I really appreciate you having me here. Great. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.